first love Secret place and highest praise Shall be yours Shall be yours To your throne I'll bring devotion May it be the sweetest sound Lord, this heart is reaching for you now So I'll set my sights upon you Set my sights upon your praise Never look into another way Day and night I lift my eyes to seek you Hungry for a glimpse of you in glory, glory. To your throne I'll bring devotion, may it be the sweetest sound. Lord, this heart is reaching for you now. So I'll set my sights upon you. Set my life upon your grace Never look into another way You alone will be my passion Jesus, you will be my song You will find me longing after you bring devotion may it be the sweetest sound lord this heart is reaching for you now sing it with us to your throne i'll bring devotion may it be the sweetest sound lord this heart is reaching for Church, we're so thankful that you guys are here today. Um, just, uh, we just invite you to come and worship with us in any way that feels comfortable to you, uh, whether it's standing and screaming or sitting and whispering within your heart. We love that you're here, and we're just loving that your presence is just filling this room, and it's bringing an amazing smile to God, uh, to God's face. So please just join us. Because one of these days I'm going to fly. Over the mountain, one of these days I'm gonna ride on the silver lining. One of these days I'm gonna witness all I've been missing. One of these days, one of these days I'm gonna do all the things that I've never done. I'm gonna finish all the races that I've run but I've never won. I'm gonna see a million faces, recognize everyone. One of these days, one of these days, gonna see the hands that took the nails from me. One of these days, gonna hold the keys to the mansion built for me. One of these days, gonna walk the streets of gold that will pay for me. One of these days, Gonna see my Savior face to face One of these days One of these days I'm gonna see Just what became of me On the day that I believed And you took myself from me I believe I will see 
What I would have been if you didn't save me One of these days One of these days I'm gonna talk With all the saints that have gone before In their sandals I will walk We'll sit upon the shore And I will learn all the things That I never knew before All this and more One of these days Gonna see the hands that took the nails for me One of these days Gonna hold the key to the mansion built for me One of these days Gonna walk the streets of gold that were paid for me One of these days Gonna see my Savior face to face One of these days 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 days I'll finally be in a place where there's no more need, no more foolishness believe, no more foolish disbelief, and all the joy there will be when at last we finally see one of these days, one of these days, gonna see the hands that took the nails from me, one of these days, gonna hold the key the mansion built for me one of these days gonna walk the streets of gold that were paid for me one of these days gonna see my savior face to face one of these days one of these days Church, let's pray, then we're going to watch a quick message from the president of the Christian Missionary Alliance, John Stumble. Let's pray for his father. Thank you so much for this day that you've given us, a beautiful day, expected with the sun out most of the day. We thank you for the month of June, which is so fun here in Whatcom County, Washington State. We thank you for the quality of life that we have here. May we be good stewards of our neighborhoods, of our homes, of our families, all that you've given us and blessed us with so much, Lord. We're sometimes humble when we just realize sometimes how ungrateful we are, how complaining we are, how lack of thankfulness when we have so much. Sure, we all have our struggles and trials, and there's bills to pay, inflation to fight, and utilities are crazy and things like that. But, Lord, we are blessed more than any group of people on the planet. And because of that, Lord, we are responsible for being good stewards. We would like to be good stewards, Lord, by being thankful. And what I'd like to do this morning, Lord, is just to stop my own prayer and let the congregation, those that feel led, just to be thankful, to express gratitude for something. Anything in their lives currently or in past or part of their, their family, their lives, just to express out loud, to help remind the rest of us of things that we can be thankful for. So be close, I, before I close with an amen, I'm just going to be silent. And if you have something in your heart that you're grateful for, even if you have to sort of make yourself do it, which is actually can be a healthy thing, can totally reorientate our lives, let's give thanks at this time.
Mm-hmm. Well, we can be real with each other. Lord, I just thank you for all the blessings all the people who care. And Lord, I thank you for our youth pastor, Richard, and his family, the Finch family. And uh, as he is on a break, a sabbatical, a paternity rest, that you bless him every single day, Lord. We are grateful for him. We miss his presence here. We miss his spirit here and his family. That you, But that you would be with him in this time of rest and relaxation and getting charged up. Also, as he finishes up his bachelor's degree and prepares for full-time ministry, that you'd bless him, that he would take the classes that would be most helpful to him, that he would uh, devote himself to the study of things that will really make a difference in his life, Lord, and in the congregations that he will serve, Lord. So bless the Finches, and bless all of us today as we rejoice in your name, and as we watch this message from our president that answers the question, did you know? Did you know? We're going to know a lot of things after we watch this. So bless our listening and hearing of this uh, video message from our president. We pray in your name. Amen. You may be seated. For the 100th time, I welcome you to a video blog. Thanks for joining us. Today, I pray that our hearts and eyes and minds are enlarged to what this Alliance family is part of. With others in Alliance leadership, I'm in Ecuador for the quadrennial meeting of the Alliance World Fellowship. You're aware that we're part of this bigger family called the Christian Mystery Alliance Worldwide. The, and the fellowship that gathers us together under the leadership of our brother Jura is a wonderful fraternal organization that brings together the national churches of the Christian Mystery Alliance and the leaders of those churches. A few years ago, I was in Punta Cana Dominican Republic. And a layman in one of our church plants who was overseeing air traffic control in that city uh, was at lunch. His English was good. We were having a conversation. And he looked at me and said, so I just have one question. What's that? Are you in charge of the whole world or not? <laughs> he knew that I was president of the U.S. Christian Missionary Alliance. And from a Catholic background, he was kind of curious about how our structures were set up. I was able to explain to him, no, 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 I'm not in charge of the whole world. We're not trying to run the world for the United States. In fact, uh, when we come into a country and plant churches and bring the gospel, those churches eventually support themselves, lead themselves, train themselves, multiply themselves, and then when our role in that mission developing work is done, we're able to move on to another country, leaving behind a national church that is fully organized. So I told my friend, you have Enrique, who is your president, and just says, I'm president. I'm not jefe over Enrique, we're peers. So I think he appreciated my missiological explanation, but he leaned back in his chair and said, oh, I was wrong. I told all my buddies that the Pope was coming. <laughs> well, I'm happy to say that I'm not the Pope of the Christian Missionary Alliance and that our strategy has been for a very long time to build national churches that, as I just said, support, lead, train, and multiply themselves and also now have become mission-sending churches. So the theme of today that I trust will enlarge our hearts, minds, and eyes is the theme of, did you know? Did you know this about your family? I'm gonna welcome in various of the participants of this event that I find passing through this courtyard. Glad you're here. Did you know that the Alliance is represented in 88 countries through the Alliance World Fellowship? I had no idea. We are part of a big global family. I have met women who do things just like I do in their context and it has been super encouraging to be connected with this global family. Did you know that in Ukraine we have Alliance work 
Pastor Sergei has led the planting of three churches and now we are in the midst of joining 10 to 12 churches with some new church plants that are just beginning, providing pastoral training, humanitarian resources, clothing, food, uh, ministering to families and to children. And so in the next months, would you be praying that as, as our churches join, that more churches then would be planted, more people in Ukraine would hear the good news about Jesus. Thank you. Did you know that the Alliance in Ecuador sent a family to northern Thailand to prepare for translation work among people groups? And I, on special assignment with the Alliance in the United States, met up unexpectedly with Augustine Reynoso. Could you imagine what Obi think when I told him to learn Spanish? It happened that an English speaker went to Thailand where they speak Thai to work for the least rich people groups in India where they speak other languages and our crazy Latino come and say to him you must learn Spanish this is what happened and now we are bringing Latino people as a new workers for being equipped in Thailand for their further service and deployment in the least rich people groups all this happened of this family of the Alliance did you know that the Christian and Missionary Alliance of Hong Kong raises almost $3 million a year for missions and that they send out over 100 missionaries around the world, many to places that the U.S. CNMA are not sending workers to? Did you know that in the aftermath of the port explosion in Beirut, that because the damage was so extensive throughout the city, the local government actually asked the Christian and Missionary Alliance Lebanese National Church to adopt two neighborhoods near our Bible school there to invest in the rebuilding of these homes. And because of the generosity of people in the United States and outside the U.S., the National Church was able to rebuild over 300 homes repairing walls that had been broken, uh, windows that had been smashed. And uh, because of the impact of the Alliance, the ministry and the voice of the gospel went forward. It's exciting to see that the Alliance is now gonna build a coffee shop in the middle of those communities so that ministry and connection can continue on into the future. Did you know that God is on the move in Central Asia? In August, we had two families go back to a country that we had been kicked out of 10 years ago. And we're just seeing one miracle after another, places to live, schools to go, new business, keep praying for them. Did you know that another country is receiving new workers from Chile to be fully part of our team there? Please be praying for them as they make relationships with the local people and they have to learn the language. They don't speak English, so it's an interesting dynamic. Please be praying for our team there. And did you know that as rough as the situation in Afghanistan has been, that we have refugees in one of our countries that our teams are working with there? Did you know that the Alliance has six churches in the Canary Islands off the coast of Africa, next to Morocco? There's a big volcano that just keeps spewing lava at the moment, impacting the lives of the people in our churches there. And I would just ask you to pray for them because these are committed Christians, committed to sharing the gospel, to living for Jesus in their city. Did you know that France is a very spiritual country? It's so spiritual, we actually have 100,000 registered mediums. And at the same time, we only have 5,000 evangelical pastors. How are people going to hear the gospel if there is nobody there to share it? Come and join us in France. Be part of the Alliance mission in France. Did you know that the Alliance Church of Ecuador has five workers in a West African country and they have a vision of planting the first Alliance Church in that country? Did you know that you can pursue your college degree while on the missions field? That's what I'm doing at Tokoa Falls College while doing ministry in Ukraine with the Alliance team there. There I'm working with the youth ministries in our local churches where we take kids in from the neighborhood surrounding the church and we share the gospel with them. And just recently we were able to baptize six of them and I got to be a part of that baptism while pursuing my college degree to get to the missions field long term. 
Did you know that the Alliance in Puerto Rico has 52 churches and 19 international workers in Latin America and Europe? Did you know that many of our AWF partner churches around the world are sending their own workers? Uh, my wife and I spent a number of years in Gabon, the church there, planned in 1934 by U.S. Alliance workers. Today they're sending and supporting five missionary couples in five different nations, doing it on their own. And that's just the joy of seeing the full circle of how God is using the Alliance around the world. Did you know that according to Joshua Project, the five countries with the most unreached people groups are India, Nepal, Bangladesh, China, and Pakistan. During the pandemic, the Alliance family has been able to provide relief to three of these five countries that have the most unreached people groups, India, Bangladesh, and Nepal. And did you know that through this COVID relief projects in these countries, that many non-believers were able to hear the gospel Many of our national partners were able to share the gospel. Two weeks ago, a Hindu lady was baptized into Christ. Did you know that a delegation of four pastors from Cuba came to Ecuador for AWF? And did you know that we signed another memo of understanding with that great country to help them plant churches, train leaders, and reach your nation for Christ? And did you know that this week at AWF there are many meetings going on with Latin American IWs who are being called to places like Europe, Middle East, North Central Asia, and West Africa? I'm sure you just heard many things, but I hope at least you heard this. The investment that we have made through the decades has now been multiplied. National churches outgrowing the U.S. Christian Missionary Alliance sometimes, and now sending churches taking the gospel of Jesus to places we cannot get or have not been, but the U.S. Alliance family is now part of this global sending movement of Alliance churches around the world that have kept the DNA from our earliest days until today that the gospel of Jesus is to be known and the name of Jesus is to be loved and worshiped by every tribe and tongue and people and nation. This is what we're part of. The kingdom is advancing. Be encouraged today. Goodbye from Guayaquil, Ecuador. You do now, don't you? Did you know that you and us, we are some, a part of something really special? Pretty cool, huh? Did you know that whenever you give a dollar or two dollars or twenty dollars to the Great Commission Fund, you're buying into an amazing operation that includes over 80 countries and over 800 missionaries around the world. We are, we have, that's our specialty by the way, is planting churches. Billy Graham at one time said that in his mind we were the best church planting organization in the world. Did you know that every Sunday you have opportunity to buy in to this fantastic work of God's kingdom? Ah, look at that up there. Thanks, you guys. That's what a picture looks like when it's taken against my desk. <laughs> so, so what I'd like you to do is something we're going to do once a month. You know, how many here, by the way, did you know we have an amazing mission advocate in Judy Russell? And she'll watch this later. Why don't you guys all say, hi, Judy. She goes through every Alliance newsletter, every Alliance missions video that come out, and she gives us an insert every Sunday. You see it in the bulletin, things to pray for, but she carefully selects these uh, videos, and she said, you're going to like this one, Pastor, and she is absolutely like, right. So what we're going to do is probably once a month is right after the first worship segment, we're going to launch right into a video, and that's like a Pavlovian dog thing. It's going, oh, that's my reminder that I could, if I wanted to, make a gift to missions. Pull out this green envelope if you've got one. A lot of you don't because you guys are giving online, but I believe if you give online, there's a little button that you can push that says Great Commission Fund. It says right on the second line there, Great Commission Fund, and this is how you can give to missions work. I'd like to ask, as your pastor and friend, that you give $5 today. 
can anybody here not afford $5? Because I will give it to you. <laughs> so everyone has just $5. You can do it online, you can do it here. And can you imagine, if we start doing that, maybe it grows a little bit. We will, and we do this every year, we make gifts to the Great Commission Fund. We're at a point in our lives where we like to buy in a little bit more. So I invite you to do that today. You won't get the big long spiel every Sunday, but it's when you see the missions video, a reminder of what we're doing around the world, you have an opportunity to buy into this enterprise, this eternal kingdom opportunity to bring Jesus Christ. Did you know that? Can you say amen? Good. Um, so in a few moments, uh, Matt is going to do the announcements. Let's welcome Maddie guys, right? In case you don't know, she had a name earlier. It used to be Mutchler, but now it's Guy's Way. And uh, she's going to receive the offering in a few moments, but you have time now if you want to make a gift. We'd love to see a missions bump this morning if, if you guys would help us to do that. Uh, the Mutchlers, Diane and I, every Sunday we give a modest amount to missions, but, and it happens every Sunday. It's kind of automatic for us. And if that's something you could do as well, that would be awesome. And I believe God would bless us for being sacrificial in that way. Thank you, Maddie. Man, watching that video just makes me think how just amazing our God is and just hearing all the wonderful things he's doing all over the world. You know, I think we all felt like the world was on hold with COVID, but just to see how much the church is growing and moving um, post-COVID and just see how it's flourishing and, and, and it's just so encouraging to see. It just makes me say that God is good. <laughs> and all the time? God is good. I think you can go a little bit louder, guys. God is good? And all the time? God is good. That's right. That's right. Um, you know, this weekend, Alex and I were really blessed. We uh, went out to Whidbey, and we spent two nights away, just the two of us, without Roman, which that is the first time we have been, well, I have been away from Roman at night <laughs> since he was born. Um, and we just spent wonderful time together. Um, we spent time praying and in the scripture and just resting um, before we have little baby girl come and before we finish our house here. Um, and during that time, we were, we were reading Proverbs 9, because on a Friday was the 9th, and so if you go through the days of the month, it's a fun way of doing it. Um, and that passage talks about Lady Wisdom and Lady Folly. And it's this beautiful contrast of wisdom calling out to people and inviting people in, but then you also have Lady Folly, who's also inviting people into destruction. And, and both are appealing, and they're offering food and drink and come on in. And Alex and I were talking about it, and it seems like in our world, oftentimes, lady folly is what we see more often, right? It's the more appealing option that we see around in our world. It's, it's the invitation to, to drink or party. It's the invitation to cheat to get ahead. It's the invitation to uh, do the quick thing that satisfies for a second but doesn't last. And so Alex was... Alex and I were talking, and he was saying that, yeah, it really seems like, especially he was saying, you know, with my coworkers or these young men that I'm around, that we only see Lady Folly is the one who's louder, who's calling out and stuff. And then I brought up the point in, the, in Proverbs 9.10, it says, though, that fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. And so we as Christians, we hear Lady Wisdom more because we have fear of the Lord. And so we need to have that fear of the Lord in our hearts and that relationship with God so that we hear that wisdom calling out to us. Because Lady Folly is really loud, and the sins of this world are really loud, and they're in our faces sometimes. But we as believers, when we have Christ in our heart, that's when we get to hear Lady Wisdom calling out to us and how she can be even so much louder as she speaks into our conscience and our hearts. And not that she doesn't speak to those who don't you know, know the Lord yet, right? Because I think God is always reaching out to people, even those who don't know him yet. But for us, we get to hear it so much louder. So I just want to encourage you guys this week to be keeping our ears open as, as the Lord and as Lady Wisdom is speaking out to us. So, all right, I have a couple announcements for church stuff. Um, youth group is taking a break. It's on hold for uh, the next month and a half as Richard's on sabbatical. It will gear, be gearing back up. Um, beginning of August, end of July. Um, so you will hear some more announcements about that as we get closer. So I just want to encourage you, though, at this time, as the youth group is taking a break, to be praying for our youth students and be praying for Richard, our youth pastor, as this, during this time of rest, um, that there would be just really good time of rest and good time for connections for the kids, that they can be reaching out and having wonderful connections with one another and friends and uh, 
be taking the initiative to have faith on their own rather than in that group. So, And feel free to reach out to a youth student and connect with them and take them to coffee and see how they're doing because that's a wonderful way to do that as well and to help, help those kids. So, yeah, men's group and ladies group are on Tuesday night at 6.30. All are welcome to come and join. Um, and then we also have a VBS announcement. So VBS is coming up. My mom and Amanda uh, Mutchler are spearheading that, uh, spearheading that. And we have our first meetings coming up. So those meetings are June 25th. Um, that is Soup Sunday, but this is going to be in the evening at 6.30, or sorry, 6 to, 7, 6 to 8. Sorry, guys, there's going to be a meeting. The meeting will be kind of quick, and then we'll go into doing some decorating. The theme is stellar, so we're going to make this place look like it's the moon. It's going to be great. <laughs> um, and then uh, we have another meeting uh, July 9th at 11.30. That's a Sunday, so that'll be, that one will be really quick right after church. Um, so if you guys can be there for that, that would be wonderful. We'd really appreciate it. And then lastly, there's going to be a brief 10-minute congregational meeting following church today. So please stay. All are welcome for that. Um, we'd love to have you there. All right. Yes. Ooh, yummy. <laughs> Two weeks out. So it's the 25th. That same day as that VBS meeting that's in the evening. So come get tacos in the morning and then come back in the evening and help with VBS. So <laughs> Candy's going to pass that around. So feel free to sign up for things to bring. That would be lovely. And yeah, at this time, the band is going to come up. We're going to do our worship time. And the offertorians are going to come forward and take receive your tithes and offerings. And then after your offering plate goes by, go ahead and take a minute and just say hello to the person next to you and greet them this morning. All right. Thank you, church. Church, I want to invite you to sing this song with me um, in January of 2021. Satan came from my family, and this song was an anthem for me. So please stand and know that God is working, and things are not okay yet, but they will be. Things will be okay, so we know who wins and he's on our side. My heart is breaking in a way I never thought it could. My mind is racing with the question are you still good? Can you make something from the wreckage? Would you take this heart and make it whole again? Though the mountains may be moved into the sea, though the ground beneath my tremble hear my father singing over me it's gonna be okay it's gonna be okay i've blamed myself and if i'm honest maybe i blamed you too but you would not forsake me Cause only good things come from you Though the mountains may be moved into the sea Beginning to the end, your 
so close. You have never let me down, and you won't. In the valleys, in the shadows, I know you're so close. You're so You 
will reign forever. You will reign forever. You will reign forever. You will reign forever. You will reign forever. You will reign forever. You will reign forever. of your throne whether we're here on earth or we're there up above in the clouds in heaven in your kingdom lord we are here we're bowing down and we're beholding your name we are praising every name that you are called we worship you and we praise you and we will worship you just in any way that we can with our words or with our actions you will allow us, you've given us the breath in our mouths and in our lungs to praise you, Lord. And we will continue to do this until our last breath, even with our last breath. And even if we can't even speak at all when we're up there, we will praise you and we will thank you forever. And it's your name I pray. of every blessing to my heart to sing the grace streams of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise teach me some
Father, we confess as the song confesses that we, we are prone to wander. There's a, the pull of the world that Maddie was talking about earlier. We come here for a lot of reasons. We come here to see friends, and to receive prayer, and to be encouraged. We come here to confess and to say, Lord, we messed up this week. But um, we are ever grateful for your forgiveness. I pray this morning for our church, Lord, that whatever shame, whatever guilt, whatever disappointment, um, whatever mistakes were committed, that we would recognize that you are a gracious and forgiving God. You promised to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, while at the same time calling us to a higher level of holiness. Your expectations are high. In our text today, we are called to be sanctified. But we also know that you have given us all the resources to be that. The resource of faith, the resource of your Holy Spirit, the resource of brothers and sisters that inspire and encourage us, the resource of the church, Lord, to help proclaim the standards that you have for us. But we still fall short at times. Lord, looking at my text today, my message today, my fear is that um, some might, may leave here maybe feeling more guilty, and that's not my purpose. My purpose is my belief, though, that we come to fuller um, forgiveness, we come to a fuller relationship with you when we can be honest about our shortcomings and say, Lord, I messed up, but I want to be picked back up again and move on. That's what you promised, Lord, to us. So we are prone to wonder, Lord. <laughs> and we just pray, Lord, that you would wander us right back into the arms of the shepherd and our Savior and our friend, Jesus Christ. And we pray in your name. Amen. Amen. And please be seated. As Deidre says, that is a good word. That's a good word. Um, and our reading of the word this morning is 1 Thessalonians 4. 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, verses 1 through 12. Brothers, now I have some other things to tell you. We taught you to live in a way that will please God. And you are living that way. Now we ask you and encourage you in the Lord Jesus to live that way more and more. You know that what we told you to do by the authority of Lord Jesus. God wants you to be holy and stay away from sexual sins. He wants each of you to learn how to take a wife in a way that is holy and honorable. Do not use your body for sexual sin. The people who do not know God use their bodies for that. So do not wrong your brother or cheat him in this way. The Lord will punish people who do those things. We've already told you and warned you about that. God called us to be holy and does not want us to live in sin. So the person who refuses to obey this teaching is refusing to obey God, not man. And God is the one who gives us his Holy Spirit. We do not need to write to you about having love for your brothers and sisters in Christ. God has already taught you to love each other. And truly, you do love the brothers in all of Macedonia. Brothers, we now encourage you to love them more and more. Do all you can to live a peaceful life. Take care of your own business. Do your own work. We've already told you to do these things. If you do, then people who are not believers will respect you. And you will not need to, be, to depend on others for what you need. Okay, there, that went on, didn't it? It's hard to tell up here. I'd like to start with an illustration that I was going to put in the middle of the message, but I think I'm going to put it at the beginning to help us all be part of the same team here. Is that okay with you? Um, I don't know who, where I heard this. It's been in my brain for decades, but I can imagine it happening more than once 
in a college psych class. In this college psych class, the professor was talking about shame and guilt, subjects that are very important to the human race, right? And he asked the audience of students, these are college students, he asked them, I want you to think about the one thing that you've done in your life that brings to you, to your memory, to your heart, the most grief, the most personal shame, the most guilt. I'd like to invite you to do the same thing, but I don't want a response from you, okay? <laughs> that would be a long morning, wouldn't it? But think about the thing that you were involved with, that you participated in, that, you know, you go, uh, uh, that's the worst thing that I could possibly have done. Maybe it's the thing you would least want anybody in your life to know about. The professor looked on the, it's one of these large college classrooms of a couple hundred students. Then he asked them to raise their hands, and he said to them, raise your hand if the item that you're thinking about, the event, the experience, the thing that you were part of, did not have something to do with sex. And about three hands went up. And so it's generally true that the issue of sex, especially for believers, as we, we leave an old life of choices and then we enter into a new covenant, we start to understand God's expectations of sexual purity and avoiding sexual immorality. And the word there, of course, is pornea, which is a big word we're going to cover in just a few minutes. And to realize that in Christ we're fully forgiven. So what I want to start with is just another prayer, because this is a delicate subject. I can't get around it. One of the reasons I do expository preaching, I like to go through books of the Bible, is because it makes me cover subjects I really don't like to deal with. Does that make sense? So recognizing that we have uh, a group of people here that have different experiences and also different viewpoints on the subject, um, I just want to start again with prayer. Let's do that. Father God, we start by thanking you that you have given us the mystery, the gift of sex. You've given us something wonderful, at the same time powerful and dangerous. We would recognize, because we're Christians, we've been here a long time, that you have set standards and expectations that not only has the world around us fallen so short, in fact, quite frankly, celebrates uh, differences of those expectations, those biblical expectations. But we also admit that we have fallen short, maybe even as believers and Christians. Lord, I wanted to just give us opportunity to say, Lord, yep, pastor talking today brings up some stuff that I wish had never happened. And, and sometimes it's things that have happened to us. We've been assaulted or mistreated or violated or uh, inappropriately touched or something like that. And we're still dealing with that. We're still dealing with the recovery of that injury. Sometimes even recognizing the perpetrators have never paid for that. Lord, your word here tells us that sexual immorality will not go unpunished. So we don't have to worry about punishing people. What we need to worry about is being whole. So I want to pray this, this morning, Lord, that we would learn how to exchange the guilt, the shame, the hurt, the disappointment, the bondage even of past and maybe even for some current sexual sins that are, are just uh, limiting our freedom in Christ and our ability to love and serve you. I pray you set us free today as we cover a subject that um, is difficult, one that is so contrary to our community and country around us. Uh, and sometimes it's very hard for us to explain to people. But it's my hope and prayer this morning that as we cover some of this material, that you would bless us with personal understanding, but definitely freedom. Freedom to be whole in Christ, to be whole as a whole spiritual person, whole as a relational person, and also whole as a sexual person as well. And since I'm praying about this, Lord, I pray for the integrity of the marriages and relationships in our church, uh, that you would guard them, that you would help us to guard them, keep them whole, keep them pure, keep them faithful. And I pray all this in your name. And everyone said in agreement, 
Amen. Well, I'm going to start, though, with the last verse of the 12 verses that Patty read for us, because it sort of gives us a hook on what we're doing today. The hook is being a good witness or building up our witness of Christ. Paul has, typically Paul will give a lot of theology and information, biographical information, church information, and then he launches into application. That is what he's doing today. Beginning in chapter 4 of this five-chapter book of First Thessalonians, first three chapters were kind of theological, kind of biographical, kind of explanatory. Now he's launching into this is how we are to live. And the reason we live this way, and, or he uses the word walk, by the way. The word to live is actually the word to walk. We're going to talk about that in a moment. He gives us the reason at the end of verse 12 when he says, so that, verse 12, your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you'll not be dependent upon anyone. So what's happening in these 11 verses up to verse 12 is there's a lot of reasons for you to do these things. It pleases God. It makes the church healthier. You'll be a happier, blessed person. But really important is that you'll have a better witness in our community. And, you know, these issues, especially the issue of sexuality, I think we've, we've debated them to death, haven't we? And it appears to me that the Christian community has kind of come out in the short end in terms of public opinion, public policy, Supreme Court rulings, and the like. We, we don't seem to be, can I say, winning a lot, right? But there's a different arena in which we can win. I think it's the arena of being an example of what works, makes people fulfilled and happy, which I think we can find in this passage. Are you with me so far? We're not, doing being, not being political today. We're not, uh, we're not uh, promoting any particular public policy. We're saying this is what believers believe in. This is what the church believes in. This is what churches who believe in scriptures buy into and think brings greater fulfillment in our lives. So let's start with verse 1. And there are some key takeaways. That's actually, the first couple of verses, I'll read them real quickly again. As for other matters... Paul has just finished his theology. Brothers and sisters, we instructed you on how to live, and the word there is to walk, which is usually the word used when it's talking about the lifestyle of a Christian. It's our, we, we talk about that. We talk about our Christian walk, don't we? In order to please God, as in fact you are doing, that is the first thing, is to please God, our reputation before God. Then he ends with our reputation before non-Christians. Isn't that cool? Reputation before God, pleasing him, and then our reputation before non-believers at the end of verse 12. And so we ask you, and we urge you, and that's almost, like, what's the difference between asking and urging? Uh, frankly, they're very similar, but I like the word urge. I want to just do a little tiny big Greek here, a little bit of Greek, parakaleo. It's para. And kaleo, kaleo, we get the word call. When you call people, when you reach out to people, and we're expecting things, we call out to people. Was, we get the word call from kaleo. Paro means to be alongside. Uh, like we get the word parallel, right? Train tracks are parallel, right? They're alongside of each other. They're, they're next to each other. They don't run into each other. They're alongside, supporting each other. So para kaleo is Paul reaching out to call people to a higher standard of living, but at the same time, he's saying, I'm with you in that. There are two tracks here. I'm on one, and you're the other track. I'm coming alongside you. I'm urging you. Urging is not just words. It's I'm there with you to help you out. In the Lord Jesus, to do this more and more. And just a quick note, we're going to see this phrase more and more twice in our passage today. That's the first example is in verse 1. Then he says, I, I know what, you know the instructions that I gave you. And that's a military word. These are your marching orders as Christians, what he's saying there. And I gave them to you by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ. So in these two verses, I'm going to give you five takeaways. Takeaway number one is that when he says, by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm writing to you, it reminds us that we must recognize the Bible authority, that Bible authority is Jesus' authority, and that we're actually receiving our marching orders from Jesus Christ. So on matters like this, and these are controversial matters of Christian ethics, especially in the area of intimacy and sexuality, we get our marching orders from Jesus Christ expressed to the scriptures. 
So we're not making this stop up. This just this is not us being kind of prudish and sort of old fashioned. This is what we recognize Jesus is telling us to do. The second takeaway, which I referenced already, is to live means to walk. It literally means to walk a certain way. And if we think about the how many walkers do we have here? Good for you. I used, I'm more of a walker than a jogger now. I used to be the jogger guy. <laughs> There's a certain point where walking is a lot more fun for me. You know, plugged in and walking through the neighborhood. And when I thought about the word walking, it implies some really cool things that are parallel in the Christian life. A walk, uh, uh, the walk implies a start. You got to start walking, right? From wherever, and you start from wherever you're at. I think that's kind of like conversion. Whether that's that first conversion where you decide to follow Jesus Christ, or you say, you know, I'm going to get really serious with God today. That's your starting place, and maybe the start of getting up in the morning. Lord, I'm going to start with you, my walk with you. Okay, so there's always a start, and we can always start over, right? If you're if you start walking for a while. You know, like New Year's resolution kind of stop. How many of you have done the New Year's thing? And then it goes by the wayside by the time February shows up. Well, you can always start up again. A walk can be resumed, which is very cool. So you start it. Then there's the journey. When you, when you run, you really can't do this as much. When you walk, you can take it all in. I remember when I shifted from mostly running to walking, I saw things I never saw before. Anybody find that happens to you? Like, Why? Well, I really didn't notice that fruit tree before. Oh, I didn't notice that big dog last time. Probably because I was faster than the dog earlier. Now I'm not anymore. We, we, we pay more attention to the journey. And then there's pacing. I think in Christian life and in Christian ministry, if you don't pace yourself, you can fry and burn yourself out. We almost see this in Paul, I think. Paul sometimes just talks about the exhaustion that he's going through in caring for the churches. And you, and you say to himself, yeah, Paul needed a sabbatical. I wonder if he ever took one. And I think he did. We read about him taking long trips into the desert, you know, getting, getting close to God. So I think he paced himself as well. And then there's always a destination, right? And the weird thing about this walk is you never quite totally get there, right? That's why he says more and more. Your destin our destination is to be like Jesus. That's what we say. The, we're going to walk like Jesus. We're going to do as Jesus does. But you never quite get it. You're always sort of on the way. And we need to feel comfortable with our mistakes. We need to be, feel comfortable with falling short. We need to feel comfortable that we can't just flip a switch and be suddenly 100% perfect and holy. Perfection is the goal. We know that because somebody said that in the Sermon on the Mount. Be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. But what he means by that, you're always reaching ahead. He would use the words more and more. So our love for God, our love for each other, that's great. But now we want to push it to the next level. So walking implies a start, a journey, a pacing, and a destination that we never actually reach. Takeaway number three, um, we've already referenced it, this idea that we never quite get there. We never get up and say, I am done being holy. I am done being sanctified. I am done walking toward perfection. We need to be comfortable that we never quite ever get there. And that's why he says twice. He says in verse 1, more and more, I want you to walk with the Lord Jesus. Then all the way down in verse, I said 12, it's actually verse 10. Um, He's talking about his love for God's, their love for God's family throughout Macedonia. And he says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, to do, do so more and more. Was it in church last week when I talked about one of my kids? That was one of his favorite words as a kid at the dinner table. More? <laughs> we want more of Jesus in our lives. And we can never get enough of him. Though he's always, always willing to give us all that we need and all that we can handle. Finally, I want to say this idea of being sanctified, of being uh, close to God, of being right with him is his will for us. I want you to take a quick look at verse 3. It is God's will. We just stop there. How many of you struggle with knowing God's will? It, that can be, Lord, who should I marry? Lord, what neighborhood should I live in? Lord, what college should I go to? Lord, what house should I buy? We are full of really big decisions all the way down to what flavor of pizza should we order now. I mean, there's a lot of decisions we make. I don't mean to be flippant, but how many of you wish you could just hear God say, this is my will for you and know exactly? Wouldn't that be cool? Well, in this case, he does. 
He says, this is God's will for, will for you that you be sanctified. And might I suggest that if we ignore this one, the extra ones that are more specific to us are going to be more difficult. In other words, if God might say to us, and maybe he does say to us, I'd love to tell you other stuff. I'd love to lead you in certain directions that are important to you. But how about we cover the stuff that I'm interested in? What's that, God? Well, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, I tell you, it is God's will for each of us that we be what? What's the big loaded word there? Holy or sanctified? Say different translation, sanctified. And that's one of those really big Bible words that we should know. Sanctified, I think the simplest way to look at it, it means I am set apart exclusively for God's purposes in my life. I'm set apart for him. I'm consecrated to him. I'm made holy. The word holy kind of has a weird meaning today because the holier than thou, the thou kind of thing. So what it's talking about here is talking about the transformation of our character and our values and our actions and our attitudes and our lives and our thinking and our speaking to be conformed to what Jesus wants us to be. So our thinking and our choices and our actions and the things that we say are filtered through this. Is this something God wants from me? Would this be God's will for me? And very often we pretty much know, don't we? It's not very difficult, especially in this area of sexual immorality. So let's jump into this right now. Um, the second, but let me read the second part here. And this whole middle chunk of five or six verses is dealing with a subject that most of us pastors don't like talking about. It's always a little bit risky, but we're going to do the best we can today. Again, it is God's will that you should be sanctified. And then notice how the, the next topic ties right into it. That you should avoid sexual immorality. And the word there is a single word. It's the word pornea. Pornea, and we get the word pornography or pornographic. And the word pornea always means any and all sexual activity that's outside covenant marriage, covenant biblical marriage. That covers a lot. So I'm kind of the person that I'm more, I'm more comfortable telling, telling people, talking to people about what God is in favor of, of rather than what is against. I know what God is for. I'm not going to be focused on what God is against. And we're going to come back to that in a moment. And it gets into a really interesting chunk of a verse that's, that we're not quite sure what he means here, but there's a word that's difficult. The word is the, uh, the Greek word vessel, but here it's translated body. I'll do it like this, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the pagans. Okay, here's the controversy. The word vessel is not used that much in the scriptures. There's a different word for body he could have used here. But he uses the word vessel. So commentators, and you heard that even in, in Patty's reading, it was a little bit different than the text I'm reading here, could mean the body of the person that it's concerned about here. In this case, the man's body, head to toe, whole body. Or it could mean a specific part of the body that we typically don't mention in church, which I think we all know one time about here. So it, it, that, that's the vessel, that's the part of the body that's referring to. Or equally, it could be the wife that's being referred to. And he says, "My bo your body, your body is your wife. Now, why, that has some interesting uh, potential because of you, you might remember 1 Peter 3, 7. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with the word respect is here. It's the Greek word time as the weaker partner, but the word there is also vessel. It's one of the few times the word is used. So here the wife, this is a different author. It's Peter. No guarantees are using the words the same, but Peter says treat her with honor or respect because she is the weaker partner vessel. And when we say weaker, she's not morally weaker. She's not less valued to God. It's just the obvious fact that typically, you know, you would never, ever have a male box a female, right? There should be some chuckling here because that's happening now. Anyway, you just, you just don't have, you don't have a male athlete compete against a female athlete because the male athletes would win every time, right? So that's, that's, it's a physical weakness. That's, 
should be pretty apparent for most of us. There are going to be exceptions, but pretty apparent. So he's saying here, you need to respect her because at the time this was written, sadly and wrongly, women so often in many cultures are treated as property and they didn't have the same rights, they didn't have the same legal standing as men. You need to, and this is radical stuff, by the way, for either writer, Paul or Peter, to write that women should be elevated to an equal level with men blew people's minds away. But she is the weaker vessel. She is to be treated with honor and respect. It's the same language Paul uses when he, when he speaks of um, learning to control your own body, your own vessel, that in a way that is holy and honorable or respectful. So I am not going to take a position. It's either, as you read the word body, it's either the whole man or it's part of the man that gets him in trouble or it's referring to his wife. And if you read carefully, all three work. And maybe Paul was intentionally unclear because all three applications can be interpreted to work just fine. Anyway, so let's talk a little bit. Oh, let's finish reading the passage here. The Lord will punish all those who commit such sins as we... Oh, let me go back to verse 6. Control, uh, verse 5 and 6. Uh, uh, control your body in a way your body, whatever body is, that is honorable and holy, not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God, and that in this matter, no one should wrong or take advantage of his brother or sister. So what that could mean, taking advantage of, is taking, if, if it's speaking of the wife, it's mistreating her, or if there's adultery here, it's, it's taking advantage, it's mistreating an innocent partner in this situation. All sorts of ways that can be properly interpreted. Because it says the Lord will punish. He takes it seriously. All those who commit such sins, and as we told you and warned you before, for God did not call us to be impure or unsanctified, but to live a holy life. And therefore, anyone who reject, rejects this instruction, regardless of what the culture around us says, regardless of what the world says, regardless of what the Supreme Court says, whoever rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but the very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. So quick takeaways. This is an unavoidable topic that I sort of think we should cover more, considering how relevant it is today. Number two, God's plan or God's will for sex is not complicated. And these are my words, but you can decide if it works for you. A husband and wife are permitted and encouraged to strengthen the bonds of their relationship and usually build a family through consensual, committed, loving, and exclusive intimacy which, with each other. I like using the words of Jesus, you know, because I get my marching orders, not from society, not from the government, not from the world. I get my, my, my marching orders from who? Jesus. Jesus. And this is what Jesus says. He was asked a tricky question about the delicate, difficult subject of divorce. He says to those asking the question, haven't you read Matthew 19, verse 4, that at the beginning, the creator, quote, he quotes Genesis, made them male and female. And the creator said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. Two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. I suspect that most of us, or many of us, have fallen short of this goal right here. And I'm not going to judge. I'm just going to be a voice. That this is what the standard that the scriptures have. And we live in this marvelous democracy of freedom where the First Amendment allows people to believe what they want. Go for it. I mean, I am not going to tell you what to do. But if you ask me what Jesus Christ thinks, let me read it again. Jesus Christ says, haven't you read that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female and said, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife? Two become one flesh. They are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. 
Other verses would include Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4. Marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all other sexually immoral. I don't have to judge. I don't want to judge. It's not my business to judge what people do. Again, it's our business. This is what, this is what the scriptures teach. And in our society, we say, you can take it, you can leave it. One of their pastors, words of Paul, and I, I think sometimes the church, sometimes the church is accused of treating sexual sins different than other sins. Have you ever heard that before? Well, you know something, in a sense, they are a little different. There is something different about committing adultery, which has huge ramifications. And, and some of you who have been on the receiving unfortunate end of it know the damage it does to family and in life and health. That's different than if you go out and steal a cheeseburger or a car and then some of you, you return it. Paul suggests that there's something different that's maybe even beyond description about sexual sins when he says in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 12, I have the right to do anything you say, Paul speaking to Corinth, but you know, not everything's beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I won't be mastered by anything. You say, food for the stomach and stomach for food, and God will, and God will destroy them both. The body, the body is not meant for sexual immorality, pornea, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And by his power, God raised the Lord from the dead. He will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Because do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is now one with her in body? For it is said, the two should become one flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. There is something different about this error, which is why we address it. And again, we call us to the standard, which is husband and wife, mutually committed to be close to each other, to be intimate with each other, to be um, free <laughs> to enjoy what God has given us. What, how did I put it here? Um, consensual, committed, loving, and exclusive intimacy. And then another takeaway is we like to think, well, that was then, this is now. I assure you that both the Greek and the Roman culture were further on the outside fringe than our culture today. At the very least, all culture has, has uh, a conviction about the equality of the genders. Right? We see that pretty much in our laws, everything like that. At that time, women were treated as stuff, properties, and had no rights at all, and were highly mistreated in the area that we're talking about here. And so how do we do this? Paul's situation is no different than ours. How do we navigate ourselves to a culture that we have disagreements with? We just do. Profound disagreements in this area. Well, Paul and Peter remind us that we are strangers and aliens. This is not our permanent place, is it? There's a different world to come. There's a different world to come where God's expressed will is followed. We live in an anything goes culture, really, as long as there's consent. And that's kind of where it's different than the first century Greek and Roman culture, where, again, women and children didn't have any protection back in those days. But we live in a very similar culture where anything goes as long as there is consent. But that does not give us permission as believers. And I say it this way. If you're a non-believer, I'm not going to tell you how to live your life. But if you come to me and say, you know, I'm interested in being a believer, I feel free. This is what the expectations are. Not of Pastor John or Ferndale Alliance Church. These are the expectations of our founder and our savior and our friend and our creator, the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, I reference Paul's word here about punishment. And now God will punish those who manipulate, who mislead, who defraud, who abuse, who attempt in any way to take something that really belongs 
to another and will be judged. Going on to the last three verses, verse 9. He pivots here, talking about the love that's involved with marriage and intimacy. And he talks more about family love. He uses the word phileo here, or Philadelphia, family love. Now about your love for one another, phileo love, we do not need to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. In fact, you do love all of God's family. Get this, throughout Macedonia, what does that mean? You don't, you don't just love your local church here in Ferndale, but you love the believers in, in the Philippines, in Thailand, in Ukraine. He says the churches in Macedonia, that's a big area, especially outside the airplanes and the Internet. You're, so what he's saying to these folks is your love is not just your local love, but you're committed to those outside your geographical boundaries. In other words, this is a mission-supporting church. A healthy church is a church that supports believers around the world, as we had illustrated some opportunities to do that earlier today. He starts by saying, uh, in, he says, um, uh, where does it say here? Not to be... Um, Let's see. Da, 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 da. Let's just finish it. Uh, verse 10. And in fact, you do love all God's family through Macedonians, but yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more and to make it your ambition to live a quiet life. Make it your ambition to live a quiet life. Phillips has a great translation of that here. He said, make it your ambition not to be ambitious. <laughs> make it your ambition not to be stomping over people to get the things that you want. Make it your ambition to love people and to help people. And I think the measure of our success is how much we help other people to succeed. And then once again, he talks about more and more. And again, I think this is love for people, but I think this is also love for God's work around the world. And I think part of a mark of Christian maturity is our commitment to God's missionary work around the world. And now there's an interesting verse that doesn't mean what he says. It says uh, in verse, uh, verse 11, do you see where it says, mind your own business? right? Mind your own business does not mean mind your own business. I want you to think about those four words, mind your own business. Mind your own business literally means you have business, you better mind it. But when we say that phrase in English, we have, there's an extra secondary meaning to it. What is it? Yeah. Mind your own, mind your own business is usually Get out of my business, right? That's what, when we say that phrase, mind your own business, we are saying, get out of my business. But the Greek is literal. It says, attend or mind, focus on your business. There's no second meaning to it. And so this verse is, is misused if it's used to say, we should take no concern about the spiritual life of other people because I'm supposed to mind my own business. We should take no concern about the marriages of other people because I'm supposed to mind my own business. We should take no concern over the stewardship of other people because I'm supposed to mind my own business. The Greek says, mind your business, but the rest of the book reminds it that we are concerned about the Christian business of other people. See how a phrase can get turned over the years? So mind your own business. In the Greek, it means do just that. You do just that. You have business to take care of, your own holiness, your own sexual purity, your own walk with God, your own love of people. Take care of that. But it doesn't say also you shouldn't be concerned about others because that's not what Christianity is about. Going back to the garden. Am I, brother, am I my brother's keeper? And the answer is yes, I am. I am responsible for my brother. And then one last comment, takeaway to build our witness. He says, you should mind your own business and you should work with your hands just as we told you, which is Paul minding their business, by the way. <laughs> Paul telling them to do this. Paul's minding their business, isn't he? So Paul's, if we literally mean the English version, don't mind my business, Paul is not following it very well. Nope, I want you to do what I tell you to do so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. Something interesting going on here. When we go to later on in the chapter and then in 2 Thessalonians, there were a whole bunch of Thessalonian Christians that weren't working because they had a misunderstanding about the coming of Jesus. They thought, Jesus, since Jesus could come back any second, why am I going to work? 
Why am I trying to get a paycheck? And so there were believers in this church that were not working. And later on, we find Paul uttering these immortal words, he that shall not work shall not in 2 Thessalonians. So this is an ongoing problem in this church. There were non-working Christians here. And we get sort of a hint of that here. Mind your own business and work with your hands. In other words, attend to your business just as we told you. So this issue came up when Paul was with them. The people were not working. So why do you do that? So that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders so that you will not be dependent on anybody. And there are probably few things that destroy our witness. And if we are labeled a lazy person, if we are labeled a person who doesn't take care of our own, take care of our family, when we can, there are always exceptions to those things. We destroy our witness at work, regardless of our jobs. If we're the person that people say, he doesn't really carry his load, he doesn't carry his share, he comes in work late, he checks in early and that kind of, or checks in late and that kind of stuff. We destroy, we hurt our witness if we're the lazy one. Amen? So we're called to have a good witness in our choices, in our understanding and living out sexual ethics, but also in working hard. And that's all I got for us today. Let's stand together with a prayer as we build our witness and the band will come up and lead us in a new song today. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, you have set high standards on intimacy and probably a good amount of people in this room, not, not one or two, but a large amount, have fallen short either before marriage or even after marriage. Lord, we thank you for the standards. We would like to embrace the standards, not for the world, but for us, for us as believers, as families, as church, and live those standards, Lord. And then by having an example of good marriages, good family, healthy lives, free lives, that that example might be a compelling argument for our friends. Not the decision of a court, not an argument f uh, to people to try to convince them, but just the healthy, wholesome life that we have living under your covenant and expectations, Lord. Thank you, thank you for your goodness, your goodness for giving us this amazing gift of uh, intimacy and sexuality. Thank you for giving us instructions and guidance as to what that means to us and how it works every time it's tried, Lord. So I pray for healthy marriages in this church, Lord. I pray that there would be the kind of intimacy that comes from voluntary, non-coercive, um, loving, tender um, relationships with our, in, our, in our families, Lord. I pray also you would guard our church from the horrible Horrible sins that happen uh, in groups like this. Sometimes we've read the news of a of, of, uh, person really misusing their power and their influence and uh, hurting people. May you protect us from all those types of horrible situations, Lord. Give us wisdom for that, Lord. And for anybody here who just needs help, that they can ask for help, Lord, in overcoming addictions and dependencies and immorality in their own life, Lord. Uh, there is help, Lord. So bless us now as we learn this new song about God's goodness. We pray in your name. And everybody said with me, amen. amen. I've been held. 
Thank you, church. You are set free in Christ. And honestly, it doesn't matter. There's some really bad people in the scriptures that did some terrible things, and God forgave them. God forgave Think of David. <laughs> what a mess that was, right? And a lot, of, a lot of consequences from what he did, but God still forgave him. And a good place to go is Psalm 51, which is a great psalm of confession and repentance. And... Uh, don't leave here feeling guilty. We have a gracious and forgiving God, but let's not turn his grace into license to do the things that hurt us. Amen? Father, thank you for today that we could be here and now be 